I want to start with a simple question. How do we prevent a ransomware outbreak? Now, in answering or attempting to answer that question, I feel that we concentrate on the wrong things. Concentrate on images like this. This is an image from last year, which shows the Irish army assisting when the Irish healthcare system was a victim of the Conti group and their affiliates. Now, in this case, the decryption key was actually given by the Conti group because it was a healthcare system. However, this reasonably sensational image and the approach that we take surrounding it, I'm gonna argue concentrates on the wrong things. And that in fact, the correct way to answer the initial question posed is exhibited by this image. It's professionals going about building sound detection and coming up with structured response approaches. You may even recognize two of the models from this image as being, <laughs> this is a stock image. They are also participants in today's briefing. What I want to do is utilize the Conti playbook leak as a microcosm to try and discuss how the best means of ransomware uh, prevention is answered by sound detection and response. I hope that I managed to maintain interest for the last talk of the day over the course of the next half an hour to try and ably answer that question. So what are we going to discuss today? I want to talk a little bit about who Conti are some people in the room may have heard, others may not have heard, who this nefarious group is. I want to talk a little bit about their playbook. What does this actually show? I want to share some insights from the playbook itself, then have a dive into the TTPs, the tools, techniques, and procedures, then I'll circle back to the initial question of what is sound ransomware prevention. So if we start with who are Conti. Conti are a Russian-affiliated ransomware-as-a-service group. They have widely publicised allegiances to the Russian state that was further reinforced upon the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now, there are multiple high-profile victims of Conti. One can only search online, one should search online, and every fortnight, every week, every two or three weeks, you'll find a new high-profile victim. Now, Conti are not a singular group. They operate an affiliate scheme. They license their tooling, their infrastructure, their techniques, their training material to affiliates for a share of the profit. Now, the two key sources of information that have enabled us to try, and myself to try and help build the content for today came over the course of the last year. The first was a leak from one of the affiliates last year during the summer. Now, when this talk was originally designed, that was the only information that we had available. But again, at the end of February earlier this year, a second trove of information regarding Conti was leaked by a Ukrainian affiliate, which has provided greater insights to the security community to help try and paint a better image about how Conti operate and what their techniques are. But why should we be interested? This is a critical question. So what? These leaks help us understand or paint a better image as to how threat actors of this sophistication operate. They help us understand their tradecraft, their specific tools, techniques, and procedures. If we abstract away, what it most critically helps us answer is how we go about building detection for these types of threats. It helps us take the nefarious image of a ransomware actor and put them onto defined attack paths for which we can start building our detection mechanisms. Now, what does their playbook actually show? I'll take you through this image here, as this is a website that was set up which houses some 7-zip archives which show the content of the leak itself. So I'll click through a few of them and show you the significance of each of these. So we start with the chat logs themselves. These are years worth of chat logs which enable us to get an insight as to how the group has matured. Specific organisations that they've targeted, organisations that they've successfully exploited. The ways or the technical skill of, their, um, of some of their affiliates and the operators themselves. The vulnerabilities that they like to target as well. If we look at the next two of those, let's say the internal software and the tooling insights, 
These help us paint an image as to how they operate internally within the affiliates and within the group themselves. And the tooling insights, they help us understand exactly how they operate when it comes to exploiting uh, organisations and therefore, critically, it can help give us the wisdom to understand how we can detect their activity should any of our organisations or customers be victim of their attacks. And lastly, training material. This again helps us provide an insight as to how sophisticated the operation actually is. Now, what does a training regime show? Within the leak itself were not only information or chat logs, we also had a plethora of screenshots, of images showing some of their operations. I want to show that the training regime takes us from this sort of faceless, unknowable threat into a defined list of techniques and procedures for which we could start to try and build some rigorous detections. I just want to take you through a few of these here. We can see what well, some raw archives showing some of the uh, information and material within the leaks. So I'm going to straight on three of them here for the sake of this example. Let's look at firstly number five there, Cobalt Strike. Number two, Metasploit. These are well-known exploit frameworks. Yes, Cobalt Strike is a licensed product. We also know it is used widely by threat actors. Number two, Metasploit. It is an open source C2 framework. We should be able to build detections for these types of tools that are used widely, not only in, uh, by threat actors, but also in pen tests. Let's also look at number six on here, PowerShell for pen testers. Now, without meaning to demean the group, my impression of this is this is a pen test 101. This is where our associates are taught in their first several months worth of time with the organization. I would argue we're not necessarily dealing entirely with a group of the most sophisticated skill. We have a list of items here for which you should be able to go about building detections. Now, in fact, red team operators don't use PowerShell. It's too easy to detect. Therefore, if we're capable of knowing the adversary that we're facing, we're far more likely to be able to detect them and hopefully then evict them in a sound and quick manner. Then move on to technical skill. Please don't worry about the exact detail of this. Again, I'll talk you through it. This is a screenshot from some of the chat logs. I find this interesting for a few reasons. There is an affiliate having to discuss with another, with another operator how to generate Metasploit shellcode, how to use something called MSF Phenom. Again, I don't associate this with the types of techniques or skill one would associate with a highly skilled, highly trained organization or operator. Now, not only that detail, but also certain things within the command itself. Firstly, we can see the type of remote access, an interpreter bind TCP shell. Now, I'll say the other two are even more interesting on here, the areas that I've highlighted. The first of which is that they're using port 4444, widely used and widely known port targeted as an, e as an egress port when carrying out exploits. Again, if anyone's on OSCP or done any uh, hack the box style exercises, it's a commonly used port. And the second one, which is the bottom one here, you see they're using bind shell. I believe the files with bind shell 64.dll. Again, this isn't something for which we have to have sophisticated detection in order to pick up. One could write a signature. Let's go and find anything within the file directory, which is called bind shell, or even shell. You're likely to finding something nefarious, I would say, is reasonably high. Again, what about the tools, techniques, and procedures specifically? I know I discussed already about Cobalt Strike, but I want to show you an image of it. This is a genuine image from the leak itself. This is a Cobalt Strike team server. What we can see here are various victims of Conti. Now, I know these may seem specific ones to Conti and the playbook leak. However, we can again start abstracting this further and understanding that if we're capable of detecting Conti's usage of Cobalt Strike, we have a strong, incredibly high likelihood of being able to detect it when any adversary is using it against our networks. I'll just talk a little bit about the insights of the playbook. Now I'm just going to click through six strings that appeared repeatedly in the leak. I'm going to ask you to read through them here, but my assumption is that some, if not everyone in the audience, has come across at least one, if not all, of these that are listed here. I'm sure people have heard about Mimikatz. I've already discussed at length today, Cobalt Strike and Metasploit. 
These six strings, as I said, appeared repeatedly. Therefore, simply by listing the tool's techniques and procedures, it allows us to paint a more complete image as to how the threat actor operates and, crucially, where we should be concentrating our detections. If we're capable of understanding and detecting each of these, we can be confident that we can detect or prevent a Conti outbreak. Now, even if the tools, techniques, procedures listed within the leak were more sophisticated, taking a rational approach to understanding the threats that we face is the best method of mitigation. Now, to further substantiate this, when we discuss ransomware, we're talking about this one part of the kill chain. We're discussing exclusively the objectives phase. What hopefully the observant people of the crowd have realized is that what we're missing are the entirety of the steps that sit before it. Now, this is slightly adapted cyber kill chain model that we use within WithSecure. What I want to say is that each of those prior steps represent far better opportunities for detection. In effect, you have to go through all of these steps as an attacker in order to reach the objectives phase. Let's concentrate upon these initial phases in order to detect any type of adversary. Now, Katie and Jake talked at length about some of the areas of reconnaissance. But I want to focus more exclusively upon the delivery through to lateral movement phases. There are multiple layers of detection one can employ at each of these stages in order to prevent any type of adversary. It isn't just me that's coming up with some of this content. I want to cite some literature sources. I went through a recent Microsoft blog on ransomware prevention. And there are two key points within their recommendations that I want to highlight here. Now, it's a longer blog, but I thought these are the two most interesting points within it. I just want to read through them. The first one being improving security hygiene by reducing the attack surface. Again, I will cite Katie and Jake in saying, this is slightly more sophisticated than saying patch, but ultimately, hack yourself first. Make sure that you have your systems patched. But the second one is what I want to talk about in a little bit more detail today, which is implementing protection, detection, and response. Like, this seems like decent rhetoric, but what does it actually mean? I want to discuss this diagram as a means of trying to explain in a little bit more detail what protection through detection and response actually means. And I introduce the cyber kill chain, the red one above, for a second time today. I want to introduce the concept of the blue team kill chain, which is not widely seen, certainly not in public literature sources, which helps us identify and answer what good detection response effectively means. What this kill chain shows are the blue team steps needed that we need to complete prior to the attacker reaching their objectives. If we're capable of going through each of these steps prior to the objectives phase, we can say it's been a successful detection and response engagement. Let's talk a little bit more detail about a couple of these. Crucially, it does not stop at the identification phase, which sits within the middle of that blue team kill chain. We have triage, investigation, and containment. Effectively meaning that there is a time critical aspect to this. We need to be able to detect and evict, that's the crucial part, evict an attacker presence before the objectives are reached. I want to have a deep dive into some of the TTPs. It's worth saying that for this scenario or attack path that I'm going to talk about, this is only a singular attack path. This is a wholly repeatable process that can be done for every uh, TTP within the Conti leak. I've just taken one attack path. It shows a start to end uh, attack path. But as I said, this could be repeated for multiple other TTPs that are within the leak. So the first one, we know that TrickBot was recently taken over by the Conti group. Let's say someone has sent an email and they double click on it, a story that I'm sure we're all familiar with. Said access provides the remote capability to deploy cobalt strike payloads. And we can see it's been deployed to a single machine, and there is C2 access that's been provided to the attacker. Effectively, at this stage, the attacker has the access to then remotely control the machine on which we can see that yellow bug. I just want to quickly rewind to show you that Conti do not only use phishing as a means of exploit. Within the leaks, what we saw were the vulnerabilities that they favored 
to try and compromise the externally facing assets of organisations. Some of the ones that were included in there were again what, Kate, what Katie and Jake discussed, exposed RDP pools, recently seen vulnerabilities like zero logon. But another one that repeatedly appeared were vulnerable Fortigate firewalls. Now again, uh, us within MDR and our incident response team could discuss many incidents from which this has been the initial vector into an organisation. But said access providing remote code execution to then deploy Cobalt Strike and get your C2 activity. So though the initial vector was subtly different, we're now at the exact same place, regardless of whether it was your phishing email or your publicly facing vulnerability. We then see our methods of internal reconnaissance employed to try and paint a better picture as to how or as to the uh, domain structure of that organisation. And here we can see native tools like NL tests to try and list all the domain controllers on the estate. Net group to find everyone who sits within the domain admins group. We have something like AD find that was dropped to again get a better idea of the trusts across various domains. What we then see is means by which the attackers try to improve their privileges. We can see a technique which people may have heard about, but not everyone may be familiar with, of curb roasting. This is a means of trying to identify vulnerable service principal names that have a higher privilege. This will be done by querying for uh, Kerberos, Kerberos tickets, and trying to decrypt some of the information that is resident within there. This takes only one exposed or weak password to then be able to compromise the estate more fully by utilising said credentials to run an attack like DC Sync. This is a legitimately used technique in order to replicate the uh, hashes within a domain controller within the Active Directory environment, but it can also be used nefariously. Now, at this point, the attacker has access to the plethora of information within Active Directory. Most crucially, the KRB TGT hash, which enables an attacker to sign any certificate for any user to get access to any resource for any period of time across the domain. What you then may see is utilisation of NTDS util. Now this gives a really similar outcome to DC Sync. It gives a full image of the Active Directory environment. Then crucially was included within the leak as well was information about how said information is exfiltrated out of the estate. A tool that was commonly used was Arclo. The type of information that may well be taken out at this point are sensitive files for the means of extortion. Information about the Active, active Directory to then exploit at a further date should action not be taken in the immediacy of gaining such access. This is the point at which ransomware may be deployed. What I'll try and highlight now is that at each of these eight phases, there are detection steps we can put in place for every one of these steps to mitigate against this type of activity. So I'm going to move on to discuss the detection opportunities for each of these phases. The first one, I'm sorry to say, you know what, let's revise that. There are seven areas where we can detect. The first is, please do your patching. It may seem like a boring recommendation which is given over and over, but it prevents against these types of activities from ever happening. The second one, let's look at means by which we can detect Cobalt Strike. I'm going to shamelessly plug a recent talk given in the October briefing by two of my colleagues, which you can see a screen grab for at the bottom left of this, uh, of this slide, which discusses Cobalt Strike in far more detail than I'm capable of giving, so I recommend everyone to review that. But I'm talking about three items that we could use as takeaway messages today in order to detect the usage of Cobalt Strike. Look for the word beacon. If you see in DLL references, beacon .dll, beacon.x64.dll is going to be Cobalt Strike. It's really that simple. There are memory artifacts that are left by attack frameworks like Cobalt Strike and exploit very, very similarly. They both utilize the same reflective DLL function. Those are artifacts that are left in memory. So if you see explorer.exe beacon out to an odd IP address, this might be a reason why. And thirdly, lateral movement techniques. Cobalt Strike is an advanced framework, but it's advanced in the respect that you can import into it what you please. If you want to use its default point and click functionality, which is as simple as a right click, they leave artifacts that are repeatable and for which we could build rigid detections. Let's look at the next one. Let's look at those C2 paths as well that Cobalt Strike utilize. 
Cohort strike in its default formation utilizes the same C2 URIs. You can build detections for these. What you can even do is go through the malleable C2 frameworks that are publicly available. Again, these use the same defined lists of URI paths. We could build detections for each of these. Now, if we go into the next phase, let's look at the internal reconnaissance phase as well. Again, this is even simpler. This is something for process based telemetry we could utilize for the means of detection. If you don't use AD find in your environment and you see it utilized with command line parameters with passwords within them, that itself is something suspicious that should be investigated. If you see NL test used in order to try and understand where the domain controllers lie, or someone trying to map the domain admins group, again, these are decent means of detection. If we want to take it a step further, let's look for usage of these enumeration commands when they originate from an injected process. Now, I discussed just in the previous slide that there are memory artifacts that we might well see, or that we do see, when Cobalt Strike exploits a running process. If that running process is running these commands, that is something for which we should conduct a thorough investigation. Moving on to the next part of curb roasting. There are again detections we can put in place to pick up this activity. Now curb roast in its simplest manner is run as a PowerShell commandlet, invoke dash curb roast.ps1. Look for that. Look for the occasions that it's imported as a .NET module. Its name is going to be curb roast. And the last one, we can look for event IDs as well. We know that the event log responsible, or that shows and documents, Kerberos service ticket requests is 4769. If Alice, who doesn't normally make these requests, is suddenly making 10,000 in a day, that is something that we should again investigate because it may well be indicative of a Kerberos, uh, a Kerberos attack. Let's move on to DC Sync and NTDS Util. I'm going to take these two together. Look at DC Sync. That leaves an event ID, 4662. If we see event ID 4662 with certain properties that are indicative of DS replication, that is something which we can detect upon, especially if it comes from a user who doesn't normally do this, account, this, this type of activity. Look at NTDS Util as well. Again, this runs as a process. Therefore, it's even simpler. We can use our process telemetry to look at NTDS Util used with the arguments IFM and create. Lastly, let's talk about R clone as well. Now, hopefully, there are mechanisms one can use to detect this that don't even need this form of process data. We should have you know, application whitelisting in place. We should have software centers from which we need to download our executables. But if R clone is used in this manner, and it's not something which is widely used across your environment, that is something which we should also try and launch an investigation in order to further uh, get further insight. Now, we'll talk about what sound prevention actually means. I know that was a single example of an attack path. But again, I want to repeat it. This is replicatable. You can take every TTP which you find within the Conti leak and prevent this and, and um, provide sorry, this type of attack path to then validate whether there's detection. We can use red teaming for future or, or for any sound prevention as well. Let's try and test the DNR capabilities that we have. Behaviors. When I say behaviors, I mean look for attack paths, look for behaviors as opposed to the individual tools themselves. That means that should the tooling change, we can at least detect the behavior which may well be utilized or employed by these tools. And lastly, again, suppress your external attack paths. To paraphrase, please do your patching. Now, lastly, I just want to circle back to the initial question on the first slide. How do we prevent a ransomware outbreak? Now, I want everyone to go away with three key messages from today that hopefully answer that question. The first of which is attack paths, not objectives. Please take the kind of approach that I've taken in plotting all of the TTPs that you see and validating whether or not there are detections in place. I want to appeal to everyone in this audience as well, which is to ask the right questions of our security teams, as opposed to saying, can we prevent Conti? Let's go a little bit deeper. 
and try and ask questions that enable the security team to validate whether their detection response practice is sound. Do we have the right context in our alerts to allow our security team to investigate properly? Do we have the telemetry to be able to chart and attack back up the kill chain to understand all of the previous phases that were exploited? And crucially, do we have sound enough practice to be able to detect and evict an attacker that may well find itself on the estate? This circles back to hopefully the sound bite that everyone can take away, which is that ransomware prevention and its best mechanism is completed through sound detection and response practice.